So you want to get into PC gaming, but don't want to take out seven mortgages, deal heroin, and sell your first into slavery. Well, that's quite unrealistic, right? Wrong. In this video, I'll run through everything you need to do to build a cheap but powerful gaming PC so you can free yourself from the constraints of a controller and protect your virginity even harder. So let's get right to it. When it comes to choosing parts for a build like this, I always follow one rule, and that is old but gold. No, that doesn't mean I like older women. What that does mean is that if a component is old enough to be really cheap, but still performs well by today's standards, we are yanking that shit faster than the fat kid at Morrison's when someone's going out free samples. As our first example of this rule I just made up, we have our CPU. This is the Intel Xeon X3430. It's an overclockable quad core server CPU from late 2009, which can still handle modern gaming really damn well. Especially when you realise this thing came out at the same time as Modern Warfare 2 and New Super Mario Bros for the fucking week. And because this bastard is comparatively old as your nan, it'll only cost us a fiver. Since we're going to be overclocking this pension of CPU, we're going to need something chunky to cool it with. And that's why I picked nondescript Chinese tower heatsink. Yes indeed, the name radiates quality, doesn't it? This exact cooler might not always be readily available as its listings seem to come and go from eBay at random. But because it's one of those off-brand Chinese shites, there's always a clone of it floating around the site. And if you're doubting the skills of the minimum wage factory workers that crafted this thing, don't, because Huawei will ping your location and send their agents to beat your ass like a bongo. Basically, just look around for similar types of coolers with two fin stacks and a fan in the middle. And make sure they have at least four or six of these copper things called heat pipes. Remember, look at the bottom of it to count them, because I know someone's whack ass is going to get duped by counting the ends on the top. Even though it's only like 15 quid, it'll still be a stupid mistake to make. Also, regarding the included thermal paste, you probably shouldn't use it. Like, ever. Unless you can't afford the heating bill, because using it is a good way to set your processor on fire so you can keep yourself warm. I'd recommend this 3 quid tube of Arctic MX2 to put in between the CPU and the cooler so the heat can actually be transferred between the two. Is anyone out there? This stuff is like the industry standard for good thermal paste, so just know you're in good hands. This system also needs some RAM to actually be able to run anything. So buying some would be a good idea. I would recommend you go and buy two 4GB sticks of 1600 speed DDR3 RAM from CEX. As it's dirt cheap, 8 quid a stick, and two 4 gigs run faster than one 8GB stick. Now I know someone's OCD's popping the fuck off right now, because these two sticks don't look the same, do they? Unfortunately, the fuckwads at CEX, for all their amazing deals, can't pack matching sticks for shit. But that won't matter because they both have the same capacity and run at the same speed, making for absolutely no noticeable difference whatsoever. Now we need something to put all of these into, and that would be our motherboard. Another one I've chosen is the ASUS P7P55-M LG1156 Micro ATX. Now I know that thing's name sounds like an industrial calculator with a crippling stutter and dyslexia on top of that, but you don't have to go and buy the exact same other board as I have. You can go and choose any other non-knockoff P55 board from a reputable brand that's cheapest at the time. But if you're as techless as some comatose Amish kid, just go and find the ASUS board that I have on eBay and just buy it. You'd probably end up doing that anyway, because it's always available and only for like 30-ish quid at that. Now. This board has a small form factor, so it'll fit into most cheap PC cases pretty easily, and has all the slots we need to piece this PC together. It'll also allow us to utilise the overclocking capabilities of our X3430, which I'll show you how to do later, and we'll need to overclock it so we can keep up with our graphics card of choice. The AMD Radeon HD7870 2GB. This is a high tier graphics card from mid-2012 that can still rival the likes of the modern GTX 1050 from Nvidia, and if you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, basically don't expect any bitch tier performance when I get to the games, okay? You can get one of these cards from CX at any time for 40 quid guaranteed, which is great since you don't have to worry about its availability like some of the other components. And don't worry if yours looks totally different from mine, there are several versions from different brands, but they are literally no different from each other, so who gives in as long as it works? It's only real downside is the two 6-pin power connectors that it needs to power it, and it's not even a powder or concern either. Usually most of the cheap power supply options only have one of these connectors, which is just fucking annoying first off, and second, it would mean either having to buy a more expensive one that does have two of them, or just using a janky Molex 6-pin adapter to fill in for the missing one. And wouldn't you know it, I have the perfect solution for that problem as well. So the power supply that fits the bill for this combo of components is the Aerocool Integrator 600 watt, which is £34 brand new from CCL Computer. This thing rocks all the connectors we need to power everything in our build without any hassle, and this includes the two 6-pin connectors that we need for our graphics card. I don't actually have the 600 watt unit myself, because I didn't want to buy one especially for this video, but in testing I did use a 500 watt version that I already had with an adapter, meaning that your build will definitely run on the power supply that I've told you to get. I'll just use an Aerocool 850 watt unit for the build demo as it actually has the right connectors like the 600 watt you should buy. I did also find a Fractal Design Essence 500 watt for a bit less, but I'm not sure of its quality, so if you're feeling brave you could take the gamble and save a bit, or be safe and follow my lead. Also, for anyone worried about cheapo power supplies like this, don't sweat it, since to be honest there isn't much you can do about it at this budget anyway, but they do all have an 8 plus bronze efficiency rating which all decent power supplies actually have, so make of that what you will I guess. After that barrage of utterly incomprehensible nonsense, we have our storage. To keep this short, what you want is a 7200rpm, 500gb, 3.5 inch hard drive. This here WD Green Power hard drive is like the energy efficient version of the regular ones, meaning that they can be somewhat slower at everything. On that note, don't go anywhere near this thing, because if you do, it'll chug out on the Thomas the Tank Engine at a session while well on. The only reason I'm using this green power drive is because it's the closest thing that has anything decent that can still run most of the games reliably. You'll see what I mean by most later. You can get a decent drive from a reseller on eBay for like 15 quid fully tested. Here are a few examples of the drive you should probably consider. Or you could go to CX and buy a 500GB hard drive for like 6 quid and not know what the fuck you're getting, but for way cheaper. I don't really have a recommendation myself actually because they both have their advantages and disadvantages. So I can only really pose the two options and have you decide for yourself. And finally, the case. 
the case the situation is similar to that of the cooler in that the listings always come and go and aren't usually very consistent. So basically look on eBay for any cases for around 20 to 25 quid, make sure that everything can fit in it and make sure it comes with some fans in it, because if you don't, you might start the components of airflow and cook them alive. Trust me, it smells like pure disappointment and failure. You're going to want those fans. To see if the case actually has fans, just look in the item description and it should have a list of the features, which is where you'll find your answer. Just make sure that the case actually has the fans and not the space to put them into. Also, if the case is more than one fan, you're going to need a three pin fan split to deliver power to all of them, which you can get for a quid 50 on eBay, so no worries. This isn't important, but the name of the case that I'm using is the Zoo Storm Inwin Mano 136 ATX. Now, with the total cost coming out to about 170 quid, we can definitely say that we did a good job, especially considering it's a gaming PC. And with that out of the way, let's get onto the build because I'm tired of this shit. Alright, we'll start with our motherboard. First, unhook and lift the CPU cover like this, and then place the CPU carefully inside, making sure to align it with the dimple and markings on the socket. Then hook the cover under the screw and push the lever down tightly until it's locked back into place like this. Then you want to open the tabs on the ends of the second and fourth RAM slots like so, line up the notches and then push the sticks into the slots until the tabs click shut. Next you're going to want to start mounting the cooler, so start with the bracket and secure it to the board here as shown. Then add a blob of thermal paste onto the CPU the size of Cade's working class or the size of a P, whichever smaller at the time. Now remove any protective film from the bottom of the cooler, hook it onto the bracket and mount it down to the CPU with some force, making sure it's nice and tight. Then grab the CPU fan cable and push it onto the CPU fan header fan at the top of the board. And just so we don't have to do it later, hook up the fan splitter and the header next to it. Now undo the screws on the rear of the case and take the side panel off so we can get inside. Do the same for the other one so we can get out the cables easier and then move them out of the way so we can make room for the power supply. Pull this cables through as well and place it up against the back of the case and make sure it's fans facing down towards the vents at the bottom. Then take the screws that came with it and screw it tightly into the back of the case like so. Next grab this CPU power cable and feed it through the cutout to the front of the case. Then to make things easier, lie the case on its side. Now you should grab these things here called standoffs. They stop the motherboard from shutting out of the case and need to be screwed into it wherever there are screw holes on the board. But some cases have dimples in the place of them like this one, so you might not have to screw in all of them. Next, if you have one, you should install the IO shield. Make sure it's the right way around for your motherboard and push it into the cutout of the back until it pops in. Now when putting in the motherboard, make sure your fan cables are pushed through the back cutout and all the cables are out of the way. Now plug the CPU power cable into its header, move the cable into its groove and put the board into the case like so. Then line up the holes on the board with the standoffs and then screw it in. You're going to want to make sure you get all of them so you don't have the board droop out of the case like a limp dick when you're lifted up again. Now that's done, you can do just that and get to the cables. For now, just grab the huge 24 pin cable, route it up the back of the case like so, then pass it through and hook it up to the motherboard. You should route the majority of your cables like this because it's tidier and makes it easier to close the case afterwards. Now onto the most fiddly fucking bit, the power button, audio and USB cables. So you don't jam the headers onto the wrong pins like a fucking chimp, take a careful look at the pattern of the holes on the bottom and remember them. Here's the audio header, here's the USB header, and here's the jumble of power and reset cables. To start off this mess, pull the cables through a cutout near the bottom of the motherboard to the front of the case. Grab your audio header and go to the bottom left of the board and push it onto the matching header. Doing the same with the USB, look for the header at the bottom of the board and push it on. Now it would be practically impossible to show you how to plug in the power and reset cables like this, so time for a diagram. On the bottom right of the board, you should find a set of pins that look like this. The LED cables aren't necessary, but here's where they go anyway. Now all that garbage is all done, you'll realise that there might be one connector left over, which is the USB 3 cable. It's been left out because it isn't 100% necessary and isn't compatible with the board anyway, although I would recommend getting a cheap adapter so you can plug it into a regular USB header like so. Now, mounting the hard drive in the case isn't easy for me to show you because all cases are different. To get an idea of how you should do it, look in the case's manual for some instructions, and if you don't have a manual for your case, you can access one online by just searching the name of it. So, grab a SATA cable, hook it up to the drive like this, making sure it's the right way around, and then hook the other end up to a header on the motherboard like so. Then grab a SATA power cable like this from the power supply and then plug it into the drive like so. Now to end the neglect of our fan splitter, you'll want to round up all the leftover headers from the case fans and plug them into it like this. Then just stuff them somewhere out of the way like in an empty drive bay or something, and also do the same for the remainder of the power supply cables so they don't clog up the inside of the case. Now we're in the final stretch, you're going to want to undo this bracket at the rear of the case and break out any tabs so you can fit the graphics card in. When you've done that, grab the card, make sure it's facing the right way, and then push it into the slot until the tabs lock it in place. Then screw it in from the back, <coughs> and replace the bracket and tighten it back down to secure everything properly. Now grab those greatly anticipated dual 6 pin connectors, pass them through a nearby cutout, and plug them into the graphics card making sure that the plastic tabs lock them in place. And to finish it off, slide those panels back on, screw them shut, and die inside because that shit is finally over. So the shit that you need to do next is pretty fucking convoluted, but I've already figured it out for you, so all you gotta do is copy me. First install the free version of Windows, and boot the PC up. I won't show you how to do that since everyone and their mums have done a tutorial on it at this point. So once you're in Windows, you'll need to install the driver software that'll allow your graphics card to actually do shit. You can get it from the AMD drivers page on their site. To find the exact one for the HD7870, just go on there and select the following boxes. Graphics, Radeon HD, 7000 series, and then Radeon HD7870, GHz edition. Submit that, and then download the latest version for Windows 10, 64-bit, express install it, and then it's done. Then reboot the PC and spam the shit out of the delete key to get into the BIOS menu so we can overclock the CPU. Now just do exactly as I do. Go to the advanced tab and open onboard devices configuration and disable the onboard IDE controller which will then speed up boot times. Now back out of that and go to the AI tweaker tab. Set the AI overclock tuner to manual but set everything else to auto. Then set the CPU ratio to its max of 19 and then set the BCLK frequency to 190. This sets our CPU to run at 3.6GHz which is now enough 
wanted to take on our games. With that, exit and save changes and go back into Windows. Finally, you're going to want to download MSI Afterburner so we can overclock the graphics card and squeeze some extra performance out of it. Now you've opened it, click this little button here so it applies the overclock every time the PC starts up so you don't have to keep reopening it. Then max out the power limit, set the core clock to 1200MHz and the memory clock to 1300MHz. Save the profile and then click apply. And with that, I can finally dick about in some games and say it's for coursework. <laughs> Let's start with something simple, so here's CSGO. For those who don't know, it's a competitive esports title that's best played with high FPS. Now since the game came out around the same time as the graphics card, it makes for a really great combo and a fuck ton of frames. In the settings I turned anti-aliasing down to 2x, but slammed every other setting to max at 1080p. I then went into deathmatch, one of the most intensive game modes, and got an extremely impressive average of 119 frames per second, while barely stressing the hardware. Coupled with highs of 284 and lows of 61 FPS, the game ran extremely smoothly with basically zero stutter, making it ideal for competitive matchmaking on a budget. I need healing, I need healing. Moving on to Overwatch, although a more recent esports title like CSGO, we still see great performance across the board. I had the settings at 1080p medium with no anti-aliasing, hopped into a few games and got a great average of 87 FPS with highs of 146 and lows of 45. It's nowhere near as much as CS, but it's also nowhere near as easy to run. This doesn't mean it isn't playable, because it definitely is running just as smoothly as CSGO, which makes it great for the competitive side of the game as well. The only trouble I got was the game loading slowly at the start of matches and spawn, but that was only because of the shitty hard drive and you can hear me complaining about it a lot for the rest of the video. But you shouldn't have to deal with that, so don't worry. I'm just a little upset that this bait ass loot box did me out some coins instead of a legendary skin. Uh, and you're dead. <laughs> now what cheers me up after that tragedy is how Apex Legends, a 2019 Battle Royale title, runs on this system, and that is very well considering the literal relic it's running on. The best we could ask from this system is low settings at 1080p, but the performance that it gave in return was nothing I could complain about. In game, the system managed to push out a highly respectable average of 70 frames per second, with highs of 116 and lows of 42, no notable stuttering at all. And if I do say so, it doesn't even look half bad at these things either. Better than I expected, anyway. I can't really say much else other than how fucking astonished I am that this PC could hold up in such a modern game, and with such balanced utilisation of the junk we put in it too. Even then, I am complete horseshit at this game, so that's a shame. Doesn't really matter since we're moving on to something equally as bad. Okay, okay, I, I know how much everyone likes to shit on this game, and it's just overdone at this point. However, that's not what I meant, and I do have some genuine gripes with it. In my final benchmark at 1080p with a mixture of low and medium settings, the game's got a great average of 102 FPS with highs of 121. You might ask, what the hell's wrong with that? That sounds amazing. You're right, that would be amazing if the game didn't hitch and stutter like a crack addict at a fucking spelling bee. So when anything happened, like a fight for instance, you know, not important at all, this damn thing would take a deep dive down to a minimum FPS of fucking 8. Only for a split second, but just enough to fuck you up good. Even at a distance, landing a hit on someone would seize up the game and mess with your shit. And I know this issue comes from my trash tier hard drive as well. The rest of the system is actually perfectly capable, because when I cap the FPS to 60 to reduce load on the CPU, the system's usage sat at like 50% on everything and still shat itself if I tried to do anything. This is basically my fault though, and the shitty frame diffs that I got will be erased by a better drive, letting you keep that 102 FPS average and smoothing out the gameplay entirely. But when I knew a game like Apex runs smoother on the same hardware, I begin to question myself to say the least. Anyway, this is a problem that only I will have thankfully, and you could definitely bump up the settings at home without this shit happening. Probably on all the games as well. And, and this is what you think. This is my uh, granddad's account? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're his skins, and I've never played this game in my life, I swear. So in conclusion, is it worth it to go and build one of these things? Yeah, definitely. In the preparation for this video, I fucked up and got issues with my build. But now that you know how not to fuck up, you could build a solid gaming PC for yourself and waste countless hours of your life playing on it just like me. Please, this, this is a problem. I need help. In all seriousness, this thing has some potent value incentive behind it, because buying something like this brand new could cost you upwards of 350 quid, literally double what you could build this for. It may require some effort, but in my opinion, the savings speaks for itself. I hope this video has at least given you some kind of insight into building yourself a PC, and I hope this encourages you to do so. I have no idea how to end this travesty of a video, and it's already gone on way too long. So before Robin murders my ass, thanks for watching, and goodbye.